Welcome to the Deep Leadership Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Jim Frawley. Jim is an executive coach, consultant, and podcaster. He is also the founder and CEO of Bellwether, an executive development firm that specializes in helping corporations maximize their efficiency and enhance, enhance their growth. Jim is also the best-selling author of Adapting in Motion, Finding Your Place in the New Economy. And I'm excited to have him on the show to talk about leadership in the new economy. So Jim, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here. Yeah, it's good to meet you. And I'm really excited to talk about this topic because I think the things, the world is changing and it's changing pretty fast. And I think leadership, uh, leaders are going to have to adapt their leadership to be able to be, you know, to be able to get, to attract and, and retain the best people. So that's what I'm hoping to talk about today. And, um, but I want to start out, you know, you have coached, you've worked with a lot of leaders, just in your opinion, what makes a great leader? Uh, it's a great question and it's um it's a subjective one right because obviously what makes a great leader is dependent on it's like communication it's how people receive it um so if i were to give advice to someone looking to become a great leader i think the things that make great leaders or the best leaders i've worked with um are certainly awareness mm -hmm. of themselves um many not many well yeah a lot of the the clients i work with from an executive coaching standpoint there is an insecurity that, that just lives within them. So self-awareness is uh, very, very important for uh, an individual to discover themselves, be comfortable with themselves and, and be secure in themselves. And then conversely, to be curious, the curiosity mm -hmm. of the people around them to ask really good questions so that those people can, be, can open up and bring uh, their best aspects to it. So those two kind of dynamics, the internal and the external, are always the kind of philosophical, theoretical, uh, best traits of great leadership. And then from a tactical standpoint, you have to know how to put together a plan. You have to know how to communicate it and you have to know how to change it. Um, yeah. So those are my three kind of uh, tactical steps too. I, I love that you touched on the idea of self-awareness and insecurity. One of the things I've noticed, I did 22 years working in corporate and I noticed that there were a lot of fears, fear, I always say fear-based actions by managers. And a lot of it went back to being insecure. And so they would do things like micromanagers, for example, there was, it was like, I, I'm afraid to lose this job. And so I've got to control everything about it. And so I saw a lot of it is um, a lot of poor leadership was due to fear-based activities and insecurity was one that I, I happen to notice quite a bit. So interesting, you hit, hit on that right away. And is, is that what you saw that you've seen a lot with some of your clients when you get down to the heart of some of their issues? I see it all the time and it, and i don't like to use the word insecurity mm. because people it's such a negative kind of word but everybody's got it right and, and they're coming up with different words for it right you can talk about imposter syndrome you can talk about all these other things and you know you throw whatever buzzwords you want around it ultimately it's insecurity and when i think about my 20 years in corporate insecurity drove a lot of my decisions mm. why i wasn't going after certain types of projects why i didn't get the feedback that i wanted i was always looking externally and blaming external things but when we flip it on its head and we take a look at ourselves and we say you know is insecurity driving this or what am i actually afraid of when you're able to to eliminate that line item all of a sudden your your opportunities just go completely through the roof in terms of what's capable and what's possible mm, interesting interesting yeah i saw that as well as well so interesting that you found that um so let's talk a little bit about this new economy so what is uh the new economy uh, the new economy and how um business you know, explain how business leadership has to evolve to it yeah it's you know i remember back when i was in finance um everyone was talking about the new economy back in 2007 2008 right i feel like there's always a new economy and uh, i think that is the new economy is that it's consistently changing mm -hmm. and so what i teach leaders now is you know business leadership is beyond just these tactical steps of things you have to do it's how do you prepare people for change when they don't know what change is coming and that's fundamentally what business leadership is about right now, because as we take a look, you know, we can talk about flexibility and pivoting and, and we could take a look at all these different things. But there is a philosophical awareness that leaders need now that they need to communicate to the people on their teams about a much bigger picture. I mean, when I think about what happened with COVID, things are happening faster than we can adapt. If you weren't prepared for an online marketplace at the beginning of COVID, you're out of business. And so how do you anticipate something like COVID without knowing that COVID's coming? And so how do you drive this kind of mentality and desire to be flexible and innovative in the moment and have the agency to do that 
And a big step of that is going to be losing our assumptions. So how do we eliminate our assumptions uh, as we enter this new type of everything is changing within the within a minute? And how do we set people up to kind of score those big runs when we need to score runs? I love what you're saying is that we've got to teach our people to be flexible and be able to change on a moment's notice, because at the end of the day, what's happening is is constant change and that change is accelerating. And and so if we can build teams that are resilient and they're able to, you know, move and shift with the changes that are happening and they're, you know, if you build that into the team, then whatever comes next, they can handle, whether it's a pandemic or we're going to talk about AI in a bit, you know, all these technological changes, um, they're able to deal with that or the social changes, they're able to deal with it because they're, you, we built a resilient team that can handle change. I love that, that idea. And sure. that's, you know, the social change is something that most people don't talk about. It's a very important part of it too. Mm -hmm. And the heavy lifting, you know, we talk about the people have to do the heavy lifting, um, but we want them to, I like to use the analogy of Moneyball, the, the book about Billy Bean and the, the Oakland A's. Rather than getting home run hitters up, because only a certain number of home runs get hit in a year, you get a lot more singles. Mm. And so if you can get someone on third base when a person hits a single versus nobody on base, it's the same hit, but one of them scores a run. So how do you get as many people on third base as possible so that when you just get this little hit, you just need one single to score a run, and those are the ones that are going to win games? And that's what an organization has to do is how do you frame it up so that we can load the bases so that when that change happens – everybody's ready to just need a single rather than hit that grand slam. Mm, great. Powerful for sure. So let's just switch gears to AI. So um, with AI coming online, I mean, it's, it's sort of like the rage, you know, everybody's trying to figure it out. Um, what does uh, the future look like in the workplace with AI around? Yeah. I, <laughs> uh, who knows, I guess is going to be, <laughs> I mean, it's going to be so uh, it's going to be interesting to watch what I see a lot of, organizations doing now is um planning to have an ai as a member of their c-suite right wow. and so now this is going to be a very interesting kind of ai challenges the way that we think provides us collaborates collates data does all kinds of things and it's going to touch every aspect of the business and so how do you build an ai system within your organization that is going to be able to touch that whether it's data analytics and providing you the data you need to inform really good decisions does it become make your employees superheroes where you only maybe need you know 25 percent of your workforce of people who know how to utilize utilize ai in a really impactful way and so i would say the workplace is going to be fundamentally different mm. in five to ten years than anything we've expected and it's going to be a very rocky road over that time from a people perspective and then from from an organizational business perspective yeah, I, I definitely see that happening. And one of the things I've been thinking about is a lot of the senior leaders in companies are like my age. They're in their 50s or their late 40s, right? And so they grew up in a time where there was no internet, right? And so now you're saying you've got to elevate AI, you've got to elevate data, data analytics, you've got to you got to elevate that to the to the C suite. How are how are these um, yep. let's say more seasoned uh, executives? How, how do we get them ready to be able to handle this where the best person on their team might be the youngest person on the team or it might be that technical expert that that the um, that the CEO is not normally talking to, you know, a, a data expert or, a, an, a you know, an, an IT professional. So, you know, what are some of the things you're seeing, at least, or, or hearing from your clients is how they're being able to integrate that, that that's maybe the CIO becomes a much more important element in the, uh, in the organization. Just curious, because I've been thinking about that as well. Yeah, it's, um, what's interesting about AI is AI can't really make your decisions for you yet. Mm. And so for the season, I mean, I feel like there's a bullseye, anybody, uh, I'm in my late forties, anybody like 45 and I'm like lower gen X and up, um, is going to have a particularly difficult time uh, because you just don't need that many people anymore at that age level doing that kind of work. And so that's a, that, that is a very serious concern and something that I'm thinking through a lot with my clients and, and how do we manage that and how do you get them to change a 30 year career mm. and do something completely different. But for leadership, um, it's still informing your decisions, but there is a creative process in humanity that AI can't replicate right now. Yeah. And an example I like to use is journalists have been talking a lot about AI. It's just writing stories, but AI doesn't know what stories need to be written. 
Mm. Right. And so it's only a certain point um, that AI can help you, but it can help you and it will help you significantly. So while the CIO seat is a little more elevated at this current time and will be a little more elevated, the rest of the business has to support that. The CEO and the rest of the people still need to make the strate strategic decisions to challenge AI and bring AI and incorporate AI into where the business is going forward. Very difficult when we don't know what the economy is going to look like in the next five years, but it's still an AI is going to be an important part of that in terms of execution on an operational level. And then coming up with the new ideas as we build upon what AI has already done, what's the new creative process on top of it? What's the new creative decision on top of that? And so that's going to be the, the humanity aspect from leadership that uh, the, the people of us with a little bit of gray hair, will, we could take comfort in because we'll be doing that. All right. That makes a lot of sense. You can't, you can't uh, outsource uh, decision making to AI. Not yet. Not yet. Give it time. <laughs> and you can't, like you said, it, it's it's one thing to tell AI to 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 write a story, but you've got to you've got to, like I said, the journalist has to create this is this is the story that needs to be told. Yeah. Yeah. That's still part of our humanity for now. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's uh it's an important part, right? The creativity of humanity is what's so important. And and since we I mean, as I think over the last 20 years with technology, it's done everything for us. And we've been using AI already. We're using it with Google Maps. We're using it with all these different types of things. And um, we've forgotten how to be really creative in terms of challenging ourselves. And I think this will force us back into that in, uh, in a really meaningful way. Great. So what are some leadership characteristics that might be more critical now as we make this shift to um, this, if you call it a new economy, a new workplace? Yeah, so I would say two. Um, the first thing I would say is you have to enjoy the ride because this is meant to be fun. And this is a very unique challenge. It's a very new challenge, but it's definitely a very fun challenge. And then as we said, I would say the two big things that we should be focused on, one is the ability to communicate. And we're learning a new way to communicate using AI. You know, specificity is fundamental mm. to effective communication. And when we use an AI, it doesn't have context. We have to provide that context in order to get what we want. This is a good exercise with the humans around us as well in terms of being specific in the way that we communicate making sure that we're getting what we want that's one end but then as things change so quickly our ability to ask questions is also fundamental and when i say that a lot of people look at me funny um but most people don't know the definition of a question and a question is a request for information where you legitimately do not know the answer and so when I say we have to lose our assumptions, we have to lose our judgments, we have to just because it worked five years ago, it's not going to work in the future. We're surrounding ourselves with these different types of experts, tech, tech, tech experts and everyone else. How are we asking legitimate, non-judgmental questions so that we could be learners in the moment? Because those are the people that are going to help us put our strategic plan together so that we can utilize, utilize AI and, and do everything that we need to do. So uh, communication is fundamental. And then asking good questions is going to be fundamental as well. When I think about that, I think about the idea that, you know, for, for me, you know, I've had 30 years, you know, running businesses successfully and all my, and my decision was, my decisions were based on my experience, you know, and now in the future where maybe big data and data analytics, analytics will, will, will provide the better answer. Right. And so part of, part of, I would say more experienced executives are, have got to have a little bit of humility, like the best, they may not have the best answer now it might be the tech guy you know that's been sitting you know in the computer room and finds that oh look at these data aligned there's an opportunity here that no one is seeing there's a niche that we could take advantage of and they have to be humble enough to say to say all right tell me more you know this is interesting and not say no i've been doing this for 30 years this is the way we do it uh, you know to me like there's a humility like, and you know what tell me more is my favorite question yeah yeah, humility is is fundamental. Tell me more is one of my favorite questions. And um, as I think about humility, what humility is, uh, it's I would define it as the recognition that you might be wrong. Mm. And most people don't. You know, it's a little bit of vulnerability. There's a there's a few different things there, but um, you'll hear a lot from the older people in the office as we look at generational challenges between Gen Z and Gen X and the Boomers and everybody else. Um, they claim that their experience is what's so valuable, but it's not as valuable as you think it is anymore. 
And so the only thing that your experience is valuable for is challenging the questions and bringing really good questions and challenging assumptions that people are making based on something you experienced before. But everything that we're facing now is irrelevant to anything you did in the 90s and early 2000s and even the last decade. Um, so your experience is almost irrelevant, which mm. is frightening. Um, and so, but it can inform the way that we teach people and ask really good questions and be creative. And so there are aspects where it's not completely irrelevant, but we have to be open to expanding on that experience quite a bit. I think, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think that's really, really important. I think the idea that all of your experience is almost worthless is, is, is just something that, you know, for those listening in, you might be more experienced to say, you know, uh, well, what does that mean? Maybe it's not worthless, but uh, it, it means that, the, what the decisions you made yesterday are not going to be, they're not going to have the same results as they have today. So I think being humble enough to listen to your experts, I think you, when you talked about early on this insecurity, if you have insecurity, this is a good time to get over that because <laughs> you're going to yes. need to have, you're going to need to be secure in, in your, in your thoughts and your ideas and being confident and having the ability to ask questions. And like you said, ask questions where you don't know the answer. I think that's that's a fundamental uh, leadership skill that I, I love that you mentioned that for sure. Just, just curious, just in your experience working with leaders, um, can you teach somebody to be a great leader? Can you develop leadership skills where someone maybe was a subpar leader, but then becomes suddenly a great leader? Can that be taught? Absolutely, yes. Um, most of the teaching we do at Bellwether is on the awareness aspect. And most people become better uh, leaders when they have that awareness aspect, because most people don't go through don't go through this communication exercise on what other people see. Right? When we think about personality, we think about who we are. And most people, as they're coming up in an organization, they're thinking about it from a low level individual contributor, maybe a team. But as we teach them almost an executive philosophy on what does it mean enterprise wide? Where do you actually fit into it? Um, what is the awareness of what you're doing and where you're landing on other people? And then supplementing that with real tactical beneficial uh, exercises that they could do, like how do you ask a really good question? How do you test these questions? And and they can learn it in the moment. Then you you're completely changing the trajectory of an individual. Hmm. Yeah. So, but but um, I mean, but there are some people that have natural ability too. I mean, how can you tell? I mean, just working with people, can you sense that there's somebody's got a natural ability versus someone that's got to develop it? I mean. Uh, what are some signs that you might have a natural leader uh, already that you're working with? I think if you ask anybody listening to think about their team mm. and find the one person who you think is the leader on the team, they can all do it. And it's usually the person, they may not speak up often, uh, but when they do, people listen. And it takes many forms, but I would argue that, you know, the best definition of a leader is the person who brings out the best in others. Hmm. And so we all have people, some of them are introverts, some of them are extroverts. Like you can't define this specific profile on, you know, they're very uh, type A or they're very type Z. Like there, there's all kinds of different things. You could be an effective leader in many different ways. Context is incredibly important for a naturally born leader. Right. You may have a natural ability to lead, but if you're in the wrong context, then it doesn't quite work. So, so many factors have to work for your natural ability to lead to land well. And so when you think about your particular team, your particular context, the industry you're in, the business you're in, uh, the team members that you have, some people will thrive in very different contexts. So that's just as important as an individual's natural ability to lead, I would say. That's fantastic. Fantastic. What about employees? I mean, what um what what do employees and and maybe even companies need to to, uh, to how do they need to evolve to be more successful kind of going forward yeah i um for an individual uh employees a lot of the work i do there is almost explaining the change management process and what i like to get them to do is start on this inner dialogue on what are the questions we're asking ourselves and this will help us address insecurity this will help us build a belief system which i think is a fundamental aspect to being successful in the new economy is if, if you don't have a belief system in place you are going to be left behind and you're clinging to ideas that you don't necessarily believe in um, i would argue that most people don't have a belief system if you can't understand why somebody 
doesn't believe what you believe. And so mm-hmm. oftentimes now, if, if we have this insecurity and we see this a lot in the political arena, we see this a lot, you know, on the TikToks and the and everything else is people without a, a belief system in place tend to proclaim their beliefs as truths. And so when we explore ourselves and we could figure out ourselves and what are the questions and understanding other perspectives and uh, doing the whole self-love exercise and going through all of that type of work, it all begins with the individual. There's an accountability aspect to it in terms of getting things done, but taking ownership of who you are as an individual. Oscar Wilde once said, or he wrote in uh, the picture of Dorian Gray, uh, the purpose of life or the meaning of life is self-development. And he says, we've forgotten our biggest obligation. That's the obligation we have to ourselves. And I think that's where we need to start if we're going to evolve in, 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 and be successful in the new economy is everything's changing, but it's external and we can't control that. And macro change is irrelevant. It's almost a distraction. The way to respond to macro change is to focus on the one person responding to the change, the micro individual. And so macro change and micro individual, that's much of the work that we'll do with employees so that they can take the agency and take the ownership and get things done, but they have to be secure with themselves. And that starts with the belief system. It starts with this philosophical understanding of who they are as an individual and evolving that over time and recognizing that it will evolve over time and learning from the, from the, the dynamic people around them. Mm. Yeah, it's very powerful. I, I think one of the biggest pieces of advice I got early in my career is that you are you alone are responsible for your career. So there's no one else. No one's going to help you. And so you've got to you've got to like you said, if you have to adapt and evolve to the changing external environment, then you better start doing it. You better start taking classes in <laughs> in AI or whatever that you where you see things. Maybe your your uh, the role that you do is going to become automated in the future. So where, how do you make the shift and the change so you make sure that uh, you don't get left behind? So. You've got to manage that. And I love love what you talk about there and the, that core belief system, what drives you, what's your vision, where do you want to be? That's really important. Yeah, outstanding. Your yeah. book, yeah, your book yeah. is called uh, Adapting in Motion, Finding Your Place in the New Economy. What are some other things that the reader is going to find when they read through this book? Yeah, the book was, um, so I finally had the time to write it at the beginning of COVID. <laughs> I'd wanted to write it for so long. Um, and it was a lot of what I wished I had learned in corporate. Um, but as I was writing it, it, it evolved into something, you know, how do you prepare? I did executive communications and public relations for the bank, uh, during the financial crisis. So it was like worst place, worst time you could possibly <laughs> yeah. be. Um, but we went through a very challenging time and it was coming back to me as I was writing this book at the beginning of COVID, nobody knew what was happening. Um, and so ultimately came down to how do you prepare for change when you don't know what change is coming? And I wrote just this arc of change management, which is you have to start with awareness, um, awareness that change is happening faster than you can adapt and, and, you know, examples of that. But then how do you prepare for that? From preparation, you go to learning, from learning, you go to wisdom and the cycle starts again. Um, and so preparation is, you know, these are the levers that we can pull, right? It's, it's physical. We know it, your diet, your fitness, your sleep. We've heard it. We ignore it. That's just kind of the way that it is. But those are the things, usually the first levers I go to, if something's off, that's one of the things, you know, I'm either not sleeping right, I'm not eating right, or I'm not going for a run. But then there's also a mental, which is your self-love, your self-care, your belief system, and a social aspect as well. Um, who are, who's your support system? Who are the new people you're meeting to challenge your belief system and your perspectives? Uh, what are the micro interactions you're having on a social to, to make sure that you are part of this bigger picture? And those are the levers that I started when I was doing my inner dialogue and I went through this work myself, I started challenging myself on these particular areas. And that allows me to adapt in many different ways. I've got a support system in place. Who can I call if I need it? Um, is my belief system still working for me? And how do I challenge myself if something is off? And so when you go through that, you become a learner, the humility, the vulnerability, how to ask questions. And then ultimately that allows you to make really effective decisions in the moment when you have to, because that's ultimately what the new economy is about. Throw your plans out the window. It's ultimately how quickly can you make a decision in the moment that's going to be impactful because you're not going to have time to really wait on it. Hmm. Yeah. It's almost like get your house in order, right? And be ready for the shift and the change. Uh, it sounds like, I mean, you talk a lot about this. Some of the things that we talk about with self-leadership is, you know, take care of your, you know, take t- make sure that you're taking care of your support system. You have a support system in place, that you're taking care of your physical fitness, right? That you're 
that you're uh, that you're getting your sleep and, and and these things seem like they're they're not related but they are related in in, in terms of um you know your ability to be able to respond to what's happening in, at at work and 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 with what's happening with the economy is are you taking care of yourself do you have you know um are you you know dealing with you know your 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 health your mental health your physical health your spiritual health your financial health you have your house in order there you know i think those things when you yeah, have your house yeah. in order then you're able to stretch you're able to do things you're able to push yourself and the support system is a big part of it i always talk about that with leadership is Who's your support system? Who's got your back when things go wrong and you come home and you've had a bad day? You know, do you have someone you can pick up the phone and call? Do you have a mentor? Do you have a uh, an accountability group that you can call? These things are really important, and I think they're they're not trivial if you want to be able to deal with the shifting world that we're dealing with. Is you have to have these things in place. Something rock solid when everything else is shifting. You have to have a rock solid place you can go to get that support. Sounds like that's a lot of what's in this book. Yeah, if you, I mean, if the world goes left and you have to scramble to put a support system together, you're too late. Yeah. And so going back to the money ball example, you know, you're basically getting as many people on third base as you can so that you just need a single when something bad happens, you lose your job, your support system's a place, you've already been networking, you've got relationships yeah. for these people who see you when you're actually at your best. And yeah. that's when you want them to see you. Um, psychological and neurological research has found that, you know, your gut bacteria impacts the way you think about yourself and make decisions and your cognitive ability. We find out now that obesity is actually contagious. So mm. if we surround ourselves with obese people, we tend to be obese ourselves. And so how are you picking, you know, the right types of people that we're surrounding ourselves and that impacts, you know, obesity impacts your ability to think and, and also impacts your, your self-love, your self-care. Like they are all completely intertwined uh, in a, in a really meaningful way. Um, and it's not brain surgery. It's very simple, but it's about getting the things in order so that when you need to pull a lever, the lever is ready to go. Mm. Wow. Powerful stuff. So the book is called adapting in motion, finding your place in the new economy. So powerful stuff, uh, being able to adapt and change in this new environment. So, and we'll, uh, we'll talk about uh, how to find that in a little bit, but what I want to ask you is, uh, what are you working on today at Bellwether? Uh, oh, we're doing all kinds of good stuff. We're rewriting executive <laughs> development. That's what we're doing. Um, the big things going on right now is uh, we have a big event coming up um, in the fall. It's going to be just a, an on-site event in New York about creating your plan for 2024 and what's your executive philosophy and, and releasing the bellwether method, which is defining your executive philosophy. I think that's going to be fundamental to the next, uh, next book, which should be out at the end of the year. No title yet, but it's uh, how to be philosophical at work, bringing a philosophical approach to work. Oh, fantastic. So how can list, our listeners find out more about you, uh, your book, and your services and this event? Sure. Uh, the website is jimforally.com. Everything will be on there. You can also get there from adaptingemotion.com. And I'm on all the socials, so come say hello and let's talk. All right. That sounds good. Well, leaders, I encourage you to look this book up, Adapting in Motion, Finding Your Place in the New Economy. We'll put the link in there. And also this event that's happening uh, in New York in the fall. Uh, again, a place where you can focus your efforts on what you're going to do coming into the new year. So all those uh, resources are available in the links below. I highly encourage you to check out uh, Jim's work and see what he's doing. Connect with him on social media. Give him a shout out. Say you saw him on the show. Uh, that would be a good, and I'm sure he'd love to hear from you. Um, so Jim, I really appreciate you coming on the show, sharing these experiences, giving us a lot to think about in terms of being able to adapt to all the changes that we see around us. Uh, I really appreciate the work you're doing and, uh, this, this great book that you wrote. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you, John. I appreciate it. This was great. Well, that's it for today. Thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. If you like this podcast, please subscribe and share so we can continue to build a world with better bosses. Until next time, this is John Rennie saying take care and lead well.